the audience. Uh, Mark. Uh, thank you so much um, uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak today to hear these um, uh, speakers talk about risk. Uh, I feel really um, uh, lucky because uh, I work in the domain of security in which there is often no data or no data that's publicly accessible. There's no transparency because the decisions are made not just you know like behind closed doors but are secret and the enemy, the sort of facts on the ground is ever changing. And so what worked today won't work tomorrow. And so it's really sort of, it's, in, it's super interesting to hear people who are natural scientists or regulators or you know, like activists who sort of say there's data out there that exists and we want to engage in the construction and application of that data. So, um, uh, by you know, by way of introduction, there is. Uh, I'm sure that you remember uh, when the millimeter wave scanners got brought onto the market in aviation security, the naked ones, right? Like we all remember the naked ones. You know, so uh, I was part of the. You know, like I mean, consultation is too light a word, but you know, like someone drove me into a warehouse and said, "Come and see this thing." So I went in and I said, "Oh, look." you can tell whether or not I dress left or dress right. Like this is a pretty fancy machine, you know? And they said, yep. And we're going to roll it out in, uh, you know, Comox or someplace like that. And I said, oh, how are you gonna frame it? And they said, oh, we're not gonna frame it. We're just gonna tell people it's a better technology. And I said, oh guys, that's a bad mistake. And they said, no, it's gonna be fine. And within two weeks, you know, grandmas and grandpas, parents, and all sorts of people were phoning to complain about this sort of shocking invasion of their privacy. And there was a really interesting moment because what the um, uh, industry did was they said, in order to manage your concerns about privacy, we're going to take the, the memory chips out of the machine. So now there's no privacy problems because the, the machine can't store any images. And I said, well, how do you know if you got it right? And they said, Mark, stop talking. Stop asking questions. Because, of course, the removal of the memory chips from those machines meant that all of the decisions became completely unauditable. You couldn't go back and say, oh, what about that person? Did we miss something there? Was it, you know, was it an image that went wrong, the algorithm, the person screening it? And so there was a real, um, uh, you know, like there was a real... Uh, catalyst, like an industrial catalyst there, a failure of risk communication, a failure of consultation about values, privacy, security versus liberty, and the role of the technology itself where the solution to one problem created this other problem because there's no data about how well security screening works and the risk mitigation, you know, the risk benefit matrices are stupid. It's either zero because grandma went through with her knitting needles, but nothing happened to the aviation security system, or it's 9-11, or the underwear bomber, in which case it causes billions of dollars worth of, you know, and there's sort of, there's very little in between. And so, uh, you know, like one of the dynamics within security is that if you say something is a security matter, then it kind of removes it from the public. And so what I was really excited to hear about in uh, these other, uh, um, uh, in these uh, presentations was the idea of uh, engaging with the public as an agent, not just as the object of uh, risk decisions, but rather as agents, those who can make decisions, who can have opinions, who can understand things. And so what I want to do is I want to um, uh, point out what I take to be the three most important issues that we've discussed here. And You know, like I'm really thinking about um, the way in which we see uh, a recognition that scientific facts are constructed socially, not just in the lab, but also in relation to the public, in relation to the communication, right? So it's not like there's a science thing over here. I mean, I say this with love to Scott. It's not like there's a science thing over there that produces a fact, and then the fact comes and either gets interpreted poorly or well by the public, but rather the creation of facts, whether or not we trust Scott, as a natural scientist or whether we trust the lab, that's a social process as much as anything else. And so I think it's important for us to recognize the social construction of facts as much as the factual construction of the uh, social. So it seems to me that the three sort of 
uh, the three takeaways, the three sort of points um, that I would like to make. One is about this question of data. Because the question about um, uh, data or uh, knowledge, not only in terms of its availability, but its accessibility. I was really struck by uh, Keith saying it was insufficient from a kind of democratic point of view to say, here's the file. You guys do what you want with it. But rather that the, that the public needed uh, edumacation, as the Homer Simpson would say, right? Like they needed uh, training, they needed guidance, they needed a way of understanding what was good data, what was bad data, and how they might make use of this data. And I think that for me, there's also the question of uh, accessibility in terms of comprehension. I was really struck by um, uh, Meredith's point about probability, because I think that we all misunderstand probability. You know, like if there's something that's super fascinating about our inability to understand uh, prob um, uh, probability. I was at a, um, uh, a, a um, seminar on risk. And I was the only person there who wasn't a health person or an environment person. Like those were the two categories of folks who had like had thought about risk, thought about risk communication. They taught, thought about breast cancer screening. They thought about climate change. They thought about global warming. But there was nobody who was sort of engaging in those other versions. And so I think that I'm really, uh, I'm really uh, interested in uh, that question of comprehensibility, secrecy, interpretation. The second was uh, this notion of uh, communication. And in the security field, the thing that we can always point to is those, um, do you remember the uh, like color-coded uh, terror threat assessment from the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11? Uh, you know, the you know, like uh, light blue, green, yellow, red, bright red, blinking red, you know, like, and that notion of Threat communication is perfectly based in science. It is like the greatest idea is to tell people what's going on, and yet it was handled so poorly because there was no clear representation of how that threat was arrived at that it was open to ridicule and no one paid much attention. The difference is in the UK, where the UK um, uh, it used to be called bikini for reasons that they say are random, but I don't believe them. Uh, you know, like the bikini levels, like the threat levels in the UK are totally trusted and, you know, sort of like uh, have a great deal of legitimacy amongst the public. And so I think that uh, we need to, when we think about communication and uh, risk communication, we need to think again about that long building of trust, about that relationship, but also connect it to transparency, that this is the data, this is how this valuation uh, was arrived at. One of the things that always strikes me also in terms of the um, uh, security field is that there's so little discussion about uh, values in relation to that. And so, you know, as an airport security guy, I'm always being told, especially by Rafi Sella, like I don't want to point fingers, but Rafi Sella, is like this Israeli is uh, the former head of uh, Ben Gurion Airport Security, and he always says, Oh, you know, people, you can have gold levels in security like the Israelis, or you can have whatever you choose. You know, and like the idea is like, oh, well, Israeli security at the airport, that is the gold standard and everything else is below that. But like we don't want profiling of people as they travel to the airport. And that's, you know, like profiling and investigation and interrogation of every single passenger is the backbone of Israeli security. We don't want that. You know, like it's part of that unique set of values that requires the discussion that then builds the trust that allows you uh, to build uh, the data. Sorry, the other thing is that Rafi always says, well, I can tell you, but then the data is secret, and so you, there's no debate. That's the other thing that makes it that always um, I find frustrating about the, that conversation. And so uh, one of the things that uh, seems really important to me is the communication about values and the, re the relationship to um, uh, trust. I think that um, uh, the last point that I want to highlight is that um, uh, from uh, both Scott and uh, Meredith, sorry, from all, Keith, uh, Meredith, and Scott, is this notion of agency, of treating the public as if, you know, like, as if they have an actual uh, role to play. And I thought that it was really interesting that 
um, uh, both Keith and Meredith talked about enrolling the public not simply as partners for engagement, but also as active members of the creation of their own uh, environment. And so say, we're going to engage you in monitoring, in sort of discussions about value, in a relationship. One of the, you know, there are no, uh, there's no data for how well security screening at the airport works. I don't want to ruin the surprise. Um, uh, and so the, the thing that is always used is proxies, like throughput or the number of false alarms. And the thing that makes a difference with that is telling people you can have three items of 100 mils or less. And you know, like once you tell them that and they're empowered to make that decision, then the system runs much more smoothly. And so I take um, uh, everyone uh, at their, um, uh, I take everyone's point really seriously today that this engagement of the public not only is right and good, but it also, there's a, uh, there's a kind of a business case to be made for it. That engaging with the public as serious sort of um, uh, collaborators increases efficiency, has the possibility of illuminating efficiencies, and it increases legitimacy and authority, which then builds the resilience in the system. Because I think the other thing that we haven't talked about today is that uh, that systems fail. Systems fail all the time and building failure into our understanding of risk is crucial to resilience and the way I think that um, uh, the evidence shows pretty clearly the way that we build resistance is through that you know, uh, trust and engagement. I think that I'd like to pay, uh, pose two questions if I might. Um, uh, uh, maybe Monica will uh, now regret inviting me on the panel, but I'm going to I'm going to abuse my uh, my last two minutes and uh, ask a couple of questions of the panelists just to you know like uh, uh, start the conversation. My first question is um, uh, to Scott, and uh, you know like I was really struck by your presentation, in particular when you talked about the. Uh, uh, greater explicit degrees of uncertainty in this multi-dimensional matrix, environment, space, space. space. So my question is, uh, like, uh, so, uh, like, I agree with you 100%, but then what does one do in the case of something like climate change where we have reached a, uh, where, well, we don't know whether we've reached a tipping point, where there is a convincing case to be made that a tipping point is about to be reached, in which case we must act in the face of the absence of compelling evidence, right? That precautionary principle. So what do we do with that uncertainty in those moments? Because it seems to me that to act without evidence is problematic, but also in that scenario, necessary. So solve climate change. <laughs> it might take me a couple of minutes. Well, well, I'm going to ask questions of everyone else. You've got time. So, um, uh, Keith, I wanted to ask you um, uh, when you talked about the operational uh, limits of um, uh, to this kind of facilitation. Even though you talked about how useful and how productive and important it was, I wondered whether or not you would include attention as one of those resources that is scarce. You talked about time and money, and you say, no, nah, money's not really the problem so much, but really it's time. I wonder if you would count attention, either public attention or stakeholder attention, to say, in order, because in order to build that long-term relationship, it's not only that you need to stay committed to the project, but your interlocutors have to stay committed to the project for a long time. So is that a scarce resource, and uh, you know, like how, do you, how do you manage that? And then uh, finally, um, if I could ask Meredith like, um, uh, a question about uh, trust. So if uh, I, I accept your proposition that the public doesn't understand probability, so what do you think has been most effective at educating the public on questions that involve or imply the limitation of your own capacity to act? Does that make sense? So if you say, guys, like you're you're right that this is two floods in two years, but I've got bad news. That's just the way it is. That's probability. You know, might happen again next year. I, I still want you to send me ten dollars for Ottawa Riverkeeper, but I'm I can't guarantee any action, any change, any influence on the actual event because that's sort of complex and out of my control. Like, does that, is there a structural 
disincentive to educate the public about the limitations of our capacity to act, if that makes sense. Well, thank you again um, uh, for the opportunity to speak. I hope I haven't worn out my welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Not, not at all. Not at all.